Well, good, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Zoom session here in the library at Calvary Road Baptist Church in Monrovia, California. Uh, we are located, as many of you know, but maybe you who are new to this channel are not aware that we are located in the gulag known as Los Angeles County. Uh, we're at the south end of the People's Republic of California, presently presided over uh, by General Secretary Gavin Newsom. Um, and we have more than a million and a half petitions signed uh, to uh, call for his recall uh, and remove him from governor, thereby interfering with his destruction of California and his run for the presidency. Uh, so we're glad that you're here. This is our missions emphasis time at Calvary Road Baptist Church. And uh, because of the COVID restrictions on travel and stuff, it's very, very difficult to get uh, our missionaries here. Uh, we love having missionaries at our church. We, uh, we're very excited about them. Uh, we believe that we have uh, some of the finest missionaries uh, that are available for Baptist churches to partner with around the world. And uh, this evening, I'm going to introduce to you Eugene Kozichenko. Uh, Eugene is a, um, is a Baptist missionary and pastor. He's a church planter and a missionary to the Jewish people of Ukraine. But for about 68 years of my life, I always referred to his country as the Ukraine. I don't know where that came from, but I've learned that it's wrong. It's not the Ukraine, it's Ukraine. And so uh, we're looking forward to having him. So uh, if you will come online and uh, let's get your microphone heated up so we can greet each other and get this thing rolling, okay? Yes, sir. Great to be with you tonight. Well, it's, we're 10 hours ahead of you uh, here in Ukraine, and it's uh, past 8 p.m. as it is past 10 a.m. your time, but thank you for having me. Excited. Yeah, we're glad to have you here, and I'm wondering if at the very outset you would introduce to our, to our audience um, how we came to meet each other and, and our introduction long ago, but not very far away. Okay. Well, I think it was year 2005 when my family and I, we were in the States for our, at that time, first official furlough, and we flew to California where we spent time with uh, a pastor friend who used to be a missionary here in Ukraine, uh, Brother Phil Coulter. And at one, on one day, he said that um, he's going to the pastor's conference, and he invited me to go with him, which I agreed to, the best way to meet pastors for a young missionary just starting out. Uh, and we went, and it was held at your church there at Calvary Road Baptist Church. And I remember we were late due to traffic, <clears throat> and we walked in late and sat in the very back, and we never got introduced to you in the very beginning. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, <clears throat> but at the end, I think you, 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 you came to us, and you shook our hands and asked Brother, Brother Phil about me, and you said you'd give me about a couple of minutes at the end of the of the meeting that uh, I could introduce myself and talk to the pastors briefly. <clears throat> well, at the end of that uh, meeting, uh, I did, and uh, I got five meetings <laughs> out of that. And you remember came up to me and said, well, what's your uh, plan for next Wednesday? And I said, well, we're free at this time. Well, you're speaking here at Calvary Rope then. And that's how we introduced, got introduced to each other. That's how we met. And I think at that time is on Wednesday when we came with my family, uh, we in, um, introduced our ministry in Ukraine and your church voted to support us and been supporting us ever since. So that's the, the story. The short well, we're, story. we're delighted to support you. There have been several occasions where you have come by and visited our church uh, by yourself and then uh, several times you brought uh, your whole family, and this last time you were here, uh, everyone except your son Nikita, who stayed back in Ukraine to uh, kind of shepherd the, the flock while you were gone. And uh, I remember that you and I and your, your youngest son had, uh, for me, the delightful experience of driving all over Southern California looking for a place to shoot rifles and shotguns. 
<laughs> and we finally uh, ended up in the desert north of uh, Victorville. Um, and uh, we had a wonderful time and got, got some nice pictures of, of your son. I think it was his first experience with an AR type rifle and a shotgun. And I hope he enjoyed it himself. Very much so, just like I did. It was my first experience as well. well I think it's the Second Amendment in the United States. Uh, yes. We don't have that in Ukraine. So we're happy uh, that we're even allowed to have like hunting guns, but uh, not many people do. So in Ukraine, it's a novelty. Uh, yeah. So yeah, both of us enjoyed it very much. That's good, that's good. So let's, let's walk through this because there, there are some people and, and I hope with your permission to uh, share this YouTube video with preachers to introduce them to your, to your ministry. Um, so let's, let's, do the, let's do, run the whole gamut. Um, let's start out by you relating to us um, uh, a view of your upbringing and uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union, because I think the first 18 or 19 years of your life, maybe the first 20 years, Ukraine was a part of the of the of the USSR or SSSR. Is that correct? Yeah, it is. <laughs> so, yes. so tell us about that. Uh, your upbringing and the collapse of the Soviet Union. Okay. Well, I can honestly say, well, I was born in USSR, as the the lyric goes. I was born in 1974, uh, being now 35 years old. Uh, I remember how. Um, I vaguely remember Soviet Union back in those days. I remember myself when I was about 12, 13 years of age. Uh, and I think at that time, uh, Soviet Union fell apart. Uh, I think one of the main reasons why Soviet Union was unsuccessful is because they hated the Jewish people and they were very anti-Semitic in many facets of life. And that's one of the ways uh, how, you know, Israel now is a country of 75 years and Soviet Union is no more. And uh, my father's mother was 100% Jewish and my mother's mother was 100% Jewish. So I grew up not even knowing that I'm part Jewish myself. And that's interesting. I found that out later in my life. But at the age of, I think, 15 is when uh, I remember my mom took me to this uh, Orthodox temple where she and I got baptized uh, and uh, that was Orthodox procedure and ceremony but the word of God or the name of God was never mentioned in our home before it was a communist country that we had no Bible we had nothing of that sort and I remember that was my first introduction to things religious and when I was 18 and I was the second year student at the university studying foreign languages and literature that was a call throughout the university that there were Americans in town and they needed translators and I remember how I came out to meet Americans for the first time in my life I thought skipping the lectures would be a good way of practicing my English and I came to the hotel where I met Americans and the first person I ever met was Dr. Henry Benick who later became my uh, friend and director in the ministry and I remember how he was giving tests to all these Ukrainians that came to test to be their translators. And he spoke to me real fast, like Americans always do. And he said, Eugene, you understand what I'm saying? And I said, yes, sir. He said, you really understand what I'm saying? Yes, sir. Okay, you're hired, he said. And that's how I was hired. And I remember he uh, asked for my name. I said, my name is Eugene Kazachenko. He said, all right, Eugene, forget the last name. It was too hard to pronounce. And for the next two days, I traveled with, uh, with uh, two pastors that I was assigned to since I had my father's car, which he wasn't aware of. And we went to all these different places in town. But what we did mostly, we did street preaching. If you can imagine an unsaved translator standing on the side of the street, translating street sermons for preachers from the States, that was very unique and unusual. I remember standing by the foot of the ma of by the foot of the the monument of uh, Lenin. Uh, he's rather quiet these days. As a matter of fact, the monument is not there anymore. But we preached right there at the foot of the monument of Lenin. We preached Jesus Christ crucified, and that's when, for the first time in my life, I got introduced to to the gospel. And I got to translate the gospel. I was shown from the dictionary how to translate certain words, but I did not know what they meant. 
And I remember seeing my fellow Ukrainians, many would step forward at the end when the invitation was given and many would accept Christ as their savior. They would be happy, laughing. Many would be crying and giving pastor uh, hugs. I even got some hugs and kisses. And I'm thinking, I was thinking to myself, what is this all about? It's all new to me. <clears throat> so that evening, uh, after the first day of work, I went to, uh, to speak to this pastor that I work with. And I asked him, please tell me more. What is this really about? What are we doing? And he did not go into much explanation. He simply told me, he said, Eugene, you know, you are a sinner. And he directed his finger at me and he made it very personal. And since translating, I stood aside and I watched it like the outsider looking in. Right, in the, right then, I was in the epicenter of the work of the Holy Spirit. I remember how he got a grip of my heart. And I remember that he... <laughs> I remember trusting Christ as my personal savior that night. I thank the Lord for sending Americans to my life and how I found Christ. Well, Christ found me and yeah. I never let go ever since. I never let go of Christ and I praise the Lord that I can now be doing the same thing that I was doing the first day I ever got introduced to the gospel. So that's my testimony in the nutshell. And I remember that group when I uh, came back every year, ever since, and I got invited back every time, and I got promoted to the main translator and then the, to the organizer of everything, the coordinator of all the events. We gathered 17,000 people at one time on the, one of the stadiums. Uh, then the numbers started dwindling down, and the last meeting we had in year 2005, uh, 13 years later, we only had 500 people. So that shows you the interest that Soviet Union once had tens of thousands of people would come out and to almost nothing 500 people uh, in 2005 but a lot of work has been done uh, many 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 well I, I'd like to say hundreds of thousands of souls been saved and as a, of course it's all of this is a team effort over the years but I praise the Lord for America caring for uh, countries like Ukraine, third world countries, and bringing missionaries to our countries and, 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 and saving Ukrainians. Well, I, uh, I, that explains uh, the fact that you have a, uh, an Eastern European slash Southern accent to your English, because those, uh, those Baptist preachers were Southern boys, and yes. uh, you, you hung around a lot of Southern boys in those early years. And so that explains a lot. You have a most unique and uh, delightful, um, very slightly accented English. And uh, it's very easy to understand. You're, you're a very excellent communicator. Thank you, thank you. Um, so I, tell me, uh, tell us about, um, so Henry Benick, of course, is a, is a, uh, is a Baptist preacher. Uh, who went to Old Tennessee Temple University. Um, he's the head of the mission organization that you're involved with. And, and he is a, uh, a Jewish man from Cleveland, Ohio, who came to know Christ as his savior. And um, so tell us how, uh, from meeting him, you ended up uh, over time um, as, a, as a missionary to... Ukrainian people and Jewish people in Ukraine, and not just Ukraine, but in other parts of the world? Great question. Thank you. Um, well, Brother Henry, uh, we'd like to call him a Jew born anew. <laughs> that's, that's what he calls himself too. And he was saved. And I, I remember translating his testimony hundreds, literally hundreds of times. Oftentimes I would get ahead of him, of him in my translation because I knew the story. He would ask me to slow down so he, so he could look as if he's telling the story and not just me. But <laughs> he, has, he has a unique, he, he does have a unique testimony. I always admired him for that and how God worked in his life and continues working. And I, always, I was always privileged to work with him and under him. And, uh, all these years and learning so much, but 
Um, like I said before, I was promoted to the main translator, uh, translating for these big name preachers coming from the States, and then uh, being a coordinator for the group effort all throughout the years. At one time, Brother Henry asked me, he said, Eugene, you've been with us for so long. Uh, would you consider going full time with us? And I said, well, great. That's, let's do it. That's good. And he said, well, one thing, though, you have to be called to Jewish missions if you work with us. Are you called to Jewish missions? Not just missions or missionary work, but Jewish missions. And I wasn't specifically called to the Jews. And I said, no, no. Uh, he said, well, let's just put it on ice and let's just continue as we are. But, uh, you know, that's how it went. And it was in 1998. But in 1999, I had an opportunity to travel to the United States with four singing pastors and Brother Henry co-sponsored that trip. Uh, we had another evangelist from West Virginia travel with us, another missionary to the Jews, taking these pastors to all these different churches. And I served as their translator. And I remember sitting for the first time in my life, really being a Baptist by that time, baptized and preaching myself, sitting under preaching on Jewish missions, on Jewish subjects, and hearing what the Bible has to say about the Jews. Uh, in Ukraine, you rarely hear that, and I'm, as a missionary, correcting that in my ministry a lot, but I never heard a clear presentation from the Bible about why we should love the Jewish people, why they should be warm to the Lord, as the Bible says, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And I remember how God dealt with, my, with, with me about Jewish missions on that trip. But it did not happen until we went to the Holocaust Memorial in Miami, Florida. Missionary Mike King took us there. And I remember how, as you enter that place, there is a little slope going down. And as you enter, you're literally going downstairs. And the Jewish people were told as they went to the gas chambers and ovens to be burnt, you are going to hell. So they all of them literally descended to the, their place of death. So as you go in, you hear all these names pronounced of those who died in the Holocaust. You see their names and, 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 and pictures on the walls. But what really struck me the most as you enter that place, the Holocaust Memorial in Miami, Florida. And by the way, in America, every major city in the United States has a, a, a Holocaust Memorial or a museum. If you have a chance, always try to go. And I always do try to go and see that particular one. And I know you've taken me. I think it was with Brother Phil Coulter. We went to the one in Los Angeles. There is a museum there, not a yes. memorial. Yes. But that particular one, there is, as you enter it, there is an open space, this open area under the open sky. And there are life-size figures of people laying all around. They're all dead. They're all Jewish, half naked, many of them. And there is a huge hand sticks out from the middle like this, made out of people, as if they're trying to get out of this pit. And a lot of times <clears throat> Jewish people were buried alive and the earth would be moving for several days as they were dying inside the earth. So there, there's a big hand made out of people. And as you walk through, as I walked around that, uh, all stepping over these dead bodies around that hand, God really broke my heart about the Jews. The only problem these people had, they were born Jewish. That's their only problem. And the other problem that they had, the whole world hated them just because they were Jewish. God broke my heart about the Jewish people on that day. I remember I got a hold of Brother Henry while in the United States. I said, Brother Henry, is the offer still standing? Because I believe God calls me to Jewish missions. It was not a coincidence that I met a Jewish missionary. The first ever American that I met was Brother Henry Bennett, and he was a Jew. Yeah. All my dealings were throughout the ministry were with the Jewish mission board and Jewish missionaries. And God never called me to Jewish missions in particular during that time, but he did in 1999. He made it possible for me through Brother Henry again to travel to Israel. And I toured that, that, that country and got confirmed in what God called me to. And that call is still active and still live in me uh, after 20 years of surrendering to the call to go to the Jewish people and go to them first. And I always say in my ministry, if you don't go to the Jewish people first, that's fine. As long as you go, go to them last, but yeah. go. 
So that's what my ministry is, going to the Jewish people. But that's how God brought me to it and how he kept it alive and how he uses it in me, in my country and throughout the world, praise the Lord. Well, you know, this sinful world is full of paradoxes. And one of the, one of the astonishing paradoxes to me is that V.I. Lenin uh, surrounded himself with communists who were Jews. And, and they were amazingly anti-Semitic Jews. <laughs> and and it, one of the greatest paradoxes to me is, is that someone would be born Jewish, uh, embrace communism as he's growing up, and then his, uh, his virulent uh, politics basically turns him against the people who are like him. Um, and so I find it astonishing now in the USA that Hollywood is very much dominated by Jewish people. And yet the Jewish people who are so genius in their ability to tell stories and communicate are, are rallying against the state of Israel. Um, and their politics is destructive to Israel and yet they are Jewish people. I, I find that's, that's one paradox, but it just shows the depravity of, of sinful man. Uh, and the second thing is, um, I remember the very first time I went to uh, Yad Vashem in Jerusalem, the Holocaust Memorial, and, um, and it was absolutely overwhelming to me. And, uh, and then when I went to the... Los Angeles version of the Holocaust Memorial, I noticed something was different. Um, they had tacked on at the end, uh, they likened um, the Holocaust against the Jews to people being disposed against homosexuality. Uh, and the difference is, of course, uh, uh, it is not sinful to be Jewish, <laughs> uh, but homosexuality is a sinful practice uh, among other sinful practices that God has pronounced judgment against. And I think it is, I think it is reprehensible to liken being Jewish and suffering at the hands of anti-Semites to being the same as practicing uh, sexual sins and meeting with the disapproval of people that don't like your sinful lifestyle. They're, they're, they're not the same. So anybody who has the chance of going to a Holocaust memorial in the United States, I, I think that they need to prepare themselves that probably at the end of the tour, there will be a politically correct advertisement uh, for tolerance of homosexual lifestyle and practice. And if if you get everything is good up to that in my in my opinion um let me just mention um i had the opportunity my wife and i had the opportunity a number of years ago to travel to your country and spend a delightful week with you and uh i learned a bunch of things about ukraine um i had always known that the uh, general secretary of the Soviet Union, uh, Nikita Khrushchev, I knew he was Ukrainian. I knew the uh, Olympic sprint champion, Valery Bortsov, was Ukrainian. Okay. <laughs> um, and, and I knew that Chernobyl was Ukrainian. <laughs> well, it was Russian, but it was in Ukraine. But what I did not realize about... <clears throat> about Ukraine, uh, I did not realize that um, an astonishing amount of the scientific and technological expertise of the Soviet Union was actually Ukrainian. Um, and and um, I, I, was, I was thoroughly impressed with the, um, with the personality of the country. I think every country has a personality. Um, certainly every European has certain attitudes toward Americans because of American personality. 
that Americans tend to be loud, uh, Americans tend to be very smiley, Americans greet everybody, Americans laugh out loud. Uh, my impression uh, of Russians is that they tend to be dour, they tend to be sour, they tend to be uh, rather quiet, and they get irritated if you're too happy around them. Uh, but I noticed that Ukrainians tend to be a happy people. They tend to be a much more gregarious, much more smiling, much more receptive uh, to Westerners. So they're they're probably uh, my 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 opinion. Correct me if I'm wrong. They are the most Western of the Eastern European countries. That's I, my opinion. I, I personally, uh, I, I I wholeheartedly agree with your assessment. Uh, you're right in, on every count. Uh, Ukraine is in the middle of Europe. Uh, it's more on the Western side, but it's like in the middle of Europe and Ukrainians are Europeans uh, in that regard. And Ukraine was a leading republic in former Soviet Union in pretty much everything that was happening in, uh, in, uh, in the Soviet Union. Of course, being on the forefront uh, the bordering with uh, with Europe, and that's uh, that also is a, a contributing factor. But you're right. Uh, but also, um, and you know this, uh, and we both kind of discovered that when you were here, that uh, Scythians from the Bible yes. uh, are the ancient Ukrainians. Yes. So we can say that Ukraine. Well, Macedonia is in the Bible. That's uh, not far from us. But Paul also says that he preached to Scythians. And so that's a, a ancient Ukrainian. So we can say that Jews and, and Ukrainians are in the Bible. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's good. yes. Well, what if, if, I know this, this video is about you, but, and I hadn't planned on saying this, but, but our trip to, to your city was uh, very delightful. And I appreciated very much the opportunities that you arranged for me to preach in several different uh, Ukrainian Baptist churches. And one of them, was uh, was a very beautiful church located near the main river that I can't pronounce. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you were talking to the pastor after uh, I preached my message, I, I began to wander around the property. And I, there was an old uh, wooden building, a white wooden building. And I looked through the windows and I saw some old pictures. And... Um, mm -hmm. I, I came back and I asked you to ask the pastor, who were those pictures of? And the astonishing thing was uh, they were the pictures of, of the people who were the original members of the church and some apparently a dozen or so Ukrainian Baptists had been in, in Stalin's gulag prison camp. And when Stalin died, they turned out a bunch of people and set them, set them loose. And they deposited these guys on the other side of the river. They looked around and they noticed some rooftops across the river. So they, they found a boat and they ferried themselves across the river, came into the town and, and the people began asking them and inquiring about their prison camp experiences. And these guys would constantly talk about how wonderful the savior was. Well, what was it like? The savior is wonderful. Well, how, how intense was the persecution? The Savior is wonderful. Uh, what was it like uh, being malnourished for all of those years? The Savior is wonderful. And it had such an impact on that community because these guys were Christ-centered and Christ-focused. Um, and they knew that all things work together for good to them that love God. And the result was the founding of that church. Glory be to God. That was that was one of the most remarkable experiences of my life. And those men almost, well, I'm guessing that they died without fully realizing the impact that they had um, and, and the suffering that they went through was, was all part of God's perfect plan to prepare them to be the instruments uh, of his glory. And um, I just, my wife and I, uh, we talk about that. It was such a, such a wonderful experience. So Amen. if you would Amen. tell us. Yeah. I just wanted to add one little thing is that a lot of people do not realize that former Soviet Union and partially Ukraine, and of course, all of Russia is the land of Magog. 
uh, in the Bible. And of course, if Putin is not Gog, he's definitely a Gog guest, but uh, it has a lot to do with what's been going on in this territory historically for yeah. many, many, many years. So gulags and persecution of Christians and the story that you just related to us, uh, actually a part of that, that's the territory where uh, there'll be armies marching to, uh, to Israel and just, uh, it's just this, the, the land that we're in. <laughs> the yes, north of Israel. We, see, we see those of us who are pre-tribulational pre-millennialists uh, we recognize that the United States of America plays no role in, in the fulfillment of prophecy. And we find that for the last several years, the diminishing of, of the United States on the world scene uh, and, the, and the shrinking of the USA's footprint is kind of preparatory to, uh, to these things happening in that part of the world. Um, so tell us what is your what is your current ministry, uh, not only to the Jewish people in Ukraine, but also your church planting and pastoral ministry. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, I've always divided my ministry into two major parts, and one of them, of course, is winning lost to Christ, uh, mm -hmm. and in doing so, it's to the Jew first, and also to the Greek, as we practice Romans one sixteen. Uh, Winning the Jews uh, requires special effort, uh, special knowledge, and uh, sometimes funds to do more so than for the Gentiles. However, God has always provided for that. He's equipped me with the knowledge of the Jewish, I, I think, and I hope of the Jewish mind and of the Jewish ways of doing things and going about things, but also with uh, now the, the, the experience of almost 20 years that we've been at it and also the funds to do so. Uh, in that regard, also, we, as we reach the lost souls, it's, we have more Gentiles say that our ministry than the Jews. And I always say this, unless you go to them first, they'll never be reached. And yeah. we do start, starting churches is not the main <laughs> emphasis of our ministry. And we have started two Baptist churches so far. Uh, the main emphasis is winning souls and doing missionary work among the Jews and the Gentiles. But in the country that has, like, for example, one million people in population in my home city of Dnipro, and there are only 10 Baptist churches, 10, one, zero. And it's Chattanooga, Tennessee, for one, has at least 350 Baptist churches, and it's 300,050 people in population. So that tells you how scarce the churches are. They're almost non-existent. And so we do have a footprint in that. We have two Baptist churches started, Eastern Gate Baptist Church and a Menorah Baptist Church, good Jewish names for these yes. Baptist churches. <laughs> Uh, so that's one part of my ministry. The other part of my ministry has always been educating Christians about all things Jewish. For that, we do prophecy and Israel conferences. We do Christ and the Passover, say to me, presentations, special themed lectures for Christians on why they love the Jews, how to win them to Christ. Uh, special nights like Friday nights, Shabbat, Shalom nights that we do for Christians that they would get a feel, something I've never experienced in Ukrainian churches until I was preached at in America about the Jewish people. That's what I do in Ukraine as well among Baptist churches. And the third aspect of my ministry is international travel. We go to different countries where the Jewish people are found and we uh, bring them to Christ Lord willing, and also the Gentiles, and there are churches started, uh, countries like Cuba, uh, the Philippines that we recently <clears throat> been to. So in a nutshell, that's the ministry, uh, and we started official in year 2000, now it's 2021. We thought we'd uh, celebrate Big 20 back in year 2020, but it did not happen, of course, due to uh, this Chinese virus. Uh, but so in a nutshell, that's the ministry, uh, the three aspects of our, of our ministry. Yes. Uh, the Chinese virus is the gift that pe keeps on giving. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're talking about new now kinds of it, and they're requiring all these vaccines to here in this country. It's a different story, but, uh, but you're right. <laughs> so if you would, uh, tell us about your challenges, because several years ago during the Obama administration, when he was president, uh, he was nothing if not weak as a leader. And as a result of his weakness, 
um, Putin is a tough guy. Uh, the one thing I like about Putin is that he's a Russo-centric leader. Um, I think that the leader of a country should be focused on what's beneficial for his country. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have a problem with Putin being a Russo-centric uh, leader. I have a problem with him being a dictator. <laughs> um, but Obama was a president who seemed to favor every country in the world except the USA. And as the result, uh, Russia decided uh, to move into Crimea. So tell us about the impact of Russian incursion into Ukraine. Yeah. Well, and I have to add that not only Ukraine, that they inv uh, not only Crimea that they invaded, but they invaded part of uh, our territory of the two major uh, regions, Lugansk region and uh, Donetsk region. That's where most of the steel production coal mines are. That's where main factories are. The industrial heart of Ukraine has been also occupied by Russians. And that was done right after our Howard President Yanukovych fled the country after the revolution that uh, happened in the year 2013. And in 2014, they invaded uh, almost overnight. And now, was 2013, like, was that the Orange Revolution? Now, the Orange Revolution was in 2004, 2013. Okay. They called it a, a revolution of dignity is what they called it. Okay. Uh, and of course, Russia was involved in both of them. And on one day during that revolution of dignity in 2014, now in February, almost uh, 47 people were killed by Russian snipers that were situated in different buildings there right where the, the protesters were. Uh, but as soon as the president left and fled, uh, Russia invaded. Uh, and for you to better understand this, of course, you have two neighboring countries, that's Canada and Mexico. Imagine you wake up in the morning, you look in your backyard and you see Mexicans <laughs> with machine guns walking in your backyard or Canadians. Oh, but we matter. do, but we do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right. <laughs> That's unannounced, of course, and it's illegal, but somehow Americans put up with that. I don't know why, but, uh, but that's what happened in Ukraine. They were not here today. Well, right there they are, right there tomorrow. They, they invaded the country. And that's, it's been going on for a long seven years. Thousands of Ukrainian soldiers died uh, in all this, this long run. And Crimea is still not ours. So um, at first, Ukrainians were scared. Uh, the army was almost non-existent, um, not well equipped at all. And maybe if the president of America was a different person at the time, that would not have happened. We don't know. Uh, but uh, when Trump came, a lot of things changed. <clears throat> we'll have to see what Biden, what the Biden administration does now for Ukraine in that regard, because Ukraine is somewhat dependent on these countries. And if you remember how in 1992, I think it was when Ukraine signed a uh, Budapest memorandum is when Ukraine gave up all the nuclear weapons uh, for the promises from these three countries, Russia, I think it was Great Britain and America, uh, that uh, they will protect Ukraine should any other outside threat <clears throat> happen to Ukraine. Well, that's when Ukraine gave up all the nuclear weapons. And if we only had nuclear weapons now, it would have been a different story. But we are where we are. And so we have an ongoing, what they call a hybrid war at the time, at right now. And actually, it added to my ministry going to the soldiers at the front lines and bringing humanitarian aid, bringing the word of God and preaching Christ to them. And we will be traveling to the front lines in a week. Actually, the first and second of March is when we're going to be at the front with my son, Nikita, and the 10 others. And we do it every other month. Uh, so, but overall, Ukraine's economy has been damaged. Uh, people somewhat have been damaged and the country's image has been damaged, uh, the world arena. Uh, so having the war is not good. Uh, the banks the front, of Europe. The front is not terribly far away from where you live, is it? 
No, there it's only, I think it's about 200, 160, 200 miles from us, not too far. When they invaded, we actually had suitcases packed and ready to leave should they advance any further. We were closely watching if they were advancing. We thought about taking the family out. I would have returned after doing so. I don't know whether I would have fought or not, but I uh, was going to be here, stationed here. But we, it, it was very close. It was a close call. And they haven't moved further yet. <laughs> Tell me if you if you think I'm wrong. My 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 opinion is that Putin does not want to overwhelm Ukraine for two reasons. Uh, number one, he knows that for him to take over Ukraine, there would be bloodshed on a scale that is unimaginable because he's never going to persuade the Ukrainians to put up with Russians being on their soil. And you know. they will fight them to the last man. And he knows that. Yes. yes. And number two, uh, somebody, I, I read somewhere that what Putin really wants is, is to veto any possibility of Ukraine joining NATO. And NATO has a provision that any country that is currently involved in a war cannot join their country, cannot join their organization. And so one of the things that Putin accomplished by invading Ukraine is to keep NATO away from his border, something that he was not able to do with Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. And, 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 and being a Russian, therefore being paranoid, uh, he doesn't like that at all. I totally agree. Couldn't agree more. And you, you hit it on the nail head that uh, that's exactly his objective is, of course, taking Crimea over uh, is partially, well, not partially, only mainly because uh, it's the Black Sea access and all yes. the submarines and all the nuclear bases are there. And so they already have that, uh, although they always had access to it and Ukraine never denied them this access. Uh, but with the change of the, of the political situation in the country with the revolution and him seeing uh, that things may change for him, he sees the opportunity and just grabbed it. But with NATO, if only NATO, if only Ukraine became a part of NATO, then the NATO's border will be right next to Russia. And so it means if they put their nuclear weapons here in this country, the response time would be drastically lower for Russia. In other words, it's only 10 hours by train from uh, Kiev to Moscow. It'll be a couple of minutes for the rocket to fly right and hit Kremlin on the head. So that's what they're afraid of. And uh, they're trying to keep NATO as far away as they possibly can. And Ukraine being in the middle is what Putin is after. You're exactly right. Same thing goes for this country that have wars going on. And so Ukraine is deprived of a lot of uh, uh, financial help from European countries because of this war. So he does accomplish a lot of objectives of his by waging war, even a hybrid war here in Ukraine. You're right. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I think we've discovered that the, the level of uh, corruption in Ukraine is legendary. And we've discovered in the United States that we're no better. <laughs> uh, that the corruption that is going on in, at high levels is, uh, is astonishing to the average citizen in the USA. Uh, Ukrainians probably realize this is the way of the world. This is the way the world operates. Uh, it was always this way under communism and it's still this way without communism. The corruption runs deep. Yes, and I think it's the worst plague that we have here in Ukraine, the corruption. And uh, although knowing how things are in America, it seems like America has the best politicians that money can buy. Yes, yeah, <laughs> so. yeah, absolutely. And we have the best president that money can buy. <laughs> and, their, and his children, too. So, so tell us about uh, now the COVID crisis, this Chinese virus. Uh, people now think that if you refer to it as the Wuhan virus, that you're being a racist, even though the Chinese Communist Party labeled it as the Wuhan virus. Um, so how, what kind of impact has that had on your country? Our country was not hit hard with uh, the virus. I think we had uh, 
23,000, I think, 20, maybe it's up to 25,000 dead by now, which still comprises only 0.5% of all the total death that we have. It's very low percentage. Uh, this virus has 99%, almost 98, 99% of survival. And the vaccine that they now have has 93% survival rate, I mean, the cure rate. And people are still paranoid about it, which I don't think there's anything to be paranoid about, but that's my own opinion. But that in, uh, impacts the people. In the very beginning, they were all scared and they, everything was shut down. We just recently came out of the lockdown again uh, from the 8th of January until the 28th of January, we had a total lockdown, which is unheard of. Uh, but yet, uh, that really closed down and shut down a lot of things and a lot of places here in town. Uh, and it did damage our ministry in many ways, just because the people would not come out. They, they're scared to come out. They, they're scared to talk to you on the street. You could not get in their apartments. When we go out door to door, uh, visitation and door to door knocking, we almost quit doing that because we, we cannot get in the main entrance. We cannot get into, into apartments. All we can now do is just stick our flyers in the doors and leave. Um, so before we people would invite us in, not anymore. So that's that pretty much tells you how almost non-existent the ministry becomes because the ministry is about people. And if you don't have any access to the people and the government restricts that, then you don't have the ministry. <laughs> the devil is very clever, is he not? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he is. So uh, tell us, if you would, about what uh, immediate needs you and your ministry has and, and what your current prayer requests are for us. Thank you for, for, uh, for your interest, of course, and uh, we thank Calvary Road Baptist Church's church family for praying for us for all these almost 15 years uh, and partnering with us uh, in this ministry in Ukraine. Um, since we did not accomplish at least 50% of what we set out to do in year 2020, we have funds saved to do more things in year 2021, and we're intended on uh, spending those uh, in um, all the events that we have now scheduled. We have many Americans guests, American guests coming over uh, every month, starting next week, uh, running in well into the summertime. And we are hoping to achieve everything that we said that we were going to do in year 2020. So we're doing that in 2021. So that's the main prayer request that everything that we plan on doing this year comes into being. We have many Americans friend, American friends, as well as uh, many events that we plan as a ministry and as a church. So please pray for that. That's one. Another one would be we're trying to get a, a prolongation uh, extension of the lease contract for our church uh, that we have beautifully uh, re remodeled. So we would hate to lose it. Uh, it's centrally located and we're praying that will remain ours for the next three years that they will sign it and we're just about to receive or not that in the middle of March. So that would be another prayer request. As for the needs, uh, like I said, we do have funds uh, that, we are, that we can operate with. Uh, God is good to us in that. Um, I cannot really name needs, uh, physical needs that we have. Uh, I would just wish that people be healthier or at least less fear of losing that health and that they would participate in the evangelistic events that we're planning. Uh, so overall, just pray for Menorah Baptist Church uh, pray for our family, uh, pray for all the meetings that, we're about, that we will have soon, uh, and just pray because that's one thing that availeth much, and we're thankful for all the prayers you've given us in the past. Amen. Before we wrap it up, uh, two things if we could. Number one, could you uh, name and then give a, just a little thumbnail description about what's going on uh, currently with your wife and your four children, and then once you're doing that, um, how would someone, I'm going to share this video with pastors, and if a pastor wanted to reach out to you, and in consideration of many Baptist preachers, uh, it's, just, it's just a given, they want to be involved in Jewish missions, um, and then other pastors, uh, in addition to that, they want to be involved in missions work in, in that part of Europe, so how would they reach out to you and make contact? 
Okay. So start with your family and then give us uh, how to reach out and make contact with you. Thank you. Uh, family's doing great. Everybody's healthy. We, uh, my whole family did have this Wuhan Chinese virus back in uh, 2020. Uh, we were self-quarantined uh, for two weeks, and that was the only time that our church closed its doors to in-person physical services. Otherwise, it's been always open and remains open. We pray that it will remain open also. Uh, so everybody's healthy at this time. Uh, my, my son, he's finishing uh, his uh, school. He's going to be going to high school. My uh, youngest daughter, she's graduating high school this year. She will be entering uh, whatever she chooses, some university. She wants to be a doctor. And uh, my, uh, my uh, oldest son, Nikita, he has been in the ministry with me for the past two years. Uh, he's also a second year student at the Kiev Theological Seminary. Uh, and he is uh, Lord willing, and he already announced that, he, that he's gonna go into full-time ministry once he graduates. And I cannot be happier um, as a dad and as a minister myself. Uh, my oldest daughter, she is graduating uh, Kiev National University this year. Uh, and then whatever she chooses to do, you know, we'll pray for her and help her. Uh, and my wife also with my son, Nikita, she's a second year student at this Kiev Theological Seminary. Uh, so both of them. So I've got students and I'd like to say that I'm a student of the word of God. <laughs> myself. <laughs> So everybody's doing great, and they're a great help for me in the ministry, every one of them. Uh, I mean, that's the best, the best blessing I get as a, as a father and as a pastor, as a husband, as a dad, uh, seeing my kids all dressed up and being active in church and participating in every facet of the ministry, and I just could not be happier. Praise the Lord. And uh, in our ministry, uh, at this point, we're not in need of any extra financial support, if you can believe a missionary can say that, and especially a missionary to the Jews, but uh, I am saying this. Uh, however, uh, our organization, Jewish Anti Ministries, headed by Dr. Henry Bennett, they're located in Chattanooga, Tennessee, uh, they're always in need of, uh, of, uh, of help. Uh, to go to countries that we go to, Cuba, the Philippines, Israel, Ukraine, and others, uh, to conduct ministry. If anybody would like to join our groups going to these countries and winning Jews and Gentiles to Christ, uh, it's available. Uh, also, they may need funds for these churches that are started in Cuba uh, and in the Philippines. And uh, if anybody wants to support uh, this work, uh, Financially, uh, my recommendation always uh, is to go through the organization that is in Chattanooga, Tennessee, Jewish and Time Ministries. All my support goes through that organization. We're accountable to, uh, to American churches and uh, uh, by that or, uh, through that organization, JEM, Jewish and Time Ministries, which also serves as a missionary entity in itself, uh, going to all these countries and doing all this work. So Brother Henry Bennett, um, is the head of it, and uh, he would be the one to be contacted. Uh, if anybody wants to contact me, I think you may uh, make it available for whoever, my email address or my phone number. Um, so that would be the, the way to do it. Uh, I guess that's, <laughs> that's, that's the answer. <laughs> well, thank you, my brother. We're going to end recording now, and then you and I can have a couple of wrap-up uh, sentences of chatting after the, the video has, uh, has uh, come to an end. And so, Roxanne, when you stop recording, would you let me know so that uh, Brother Eugene and I can have uh, a somewhat private conversation? I thank you. Uh, before we end, I'd, I'd like to thank you so much for, um, and I know other missionaries that you've uh, interviewed before me said the same thing, and I can just uh, subscribe to what they said is you're one of the most, if not the most, outreaching and outgoing pastor to your missionaries. You participate in their needs. You participate in their lives. You, you stay in close contact. You and I do, and I know other missionaries with you too. Thank you for such a personal uh, involvement and, and, uh, and attitude that you have towards missions. And of course, that reflected is also in your church's, uh, church family's life and support that they have given us uh, physically when we were there in person, but also over the years. Thank you to Calvary Road and thank you 
Pastor Walter. God hey, man, we, we love it. It's a, it's an honor and a privilege. Uh, we love you personally, uh, your family, not just as a church, but me personally. Um, I am uh, I'm delighted uh, to have this opportunity. So let me let me bring this video to a conclusion and then we can say a couple of words to each other.